I am Jeff Foxworthy, and welcome to Gamekeeper Podcast. If you want to learn more about farming for wildlife and habitat management, then buddy, you are in the right place. Join the Gamekeeper crew direct from Mossy Oak Land Enhancement Studio as they discuss the latest wildlife and habitat management practices, news, and of course, hunting. There's no telling what you'll learn, but I'm going to tell you, I bet it's interesting. Enjoy. We're live in three, two, one. All right, everybody, here we are, West Point, Mississippi. We got a room full. Everybody's excited. Dudley and Lanny are matching. Y'all must yeah. have yeah, we coordinated did something today. today. Pants, no, boots, really. shirt, everything. Not really. Yeah. I mean, we got the same color stuff. Yeah, but Dudley's got a little more camo consciousness to it. I've got more flair. What? Yeah. I got on bottom, Lanny. What's yeah, up? White. Huh? Your logo is white. His is like camo embedded. I'm not turkey hunting. That's all right. <laughs> well, black it is, you know, Lanny has really started wearing black, y'all. But he's like Johnny Cash or something mm-hmm. now. What? I don't yeah. know about all that. Mm-hmm. You do so wear some, black a lot. Could be the Halloween coming out anymore. I do wear black a lot. I do. I, you know, I wear camo or black because when I stain it, you can't tell. You're good to go. That would and, be, you, and you stain yeah, it. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That would be good. Yeah, that would yeah, be. I'm the, that's good. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm always. So, looking down the table, the boss is here. Anytime we're talking ducks and we're talking oak trees, Tox is going to slide in for sure. That's a guarantee, uh, Dudley. So, uh, he's it's a tribute to you. We'll try he, not he, to get too jibber jabbery. Yeah. So, and sitting, look, guys, we've got two great guests here today. So, we've had Jim Ronquest once before for, from Drake Waterfowl. And it took us, what, three months to recover? Well, that, to, that, right? That's, that's, <laughs> that's right. So, Jim, as we discussed uh, the, that last time, has brought a guest with him. And uh, we're real excited to have Ryan Askew. And, and Ryan, Askren. Askren. We're really excited to have Ryan Askren. He was just so excited. Not the worst that's going to say, now. hey, can we ask you these questions? And so he just, <laughs> Bobby is I, notorious for asking somebody how to pronounce their name and then still messing it up. I am, yeah. <laughs> well, you, you have, Adam, big job. I, I did that earlier. I said, yeah, how did. do you pronounce you your name? And I've still messed it up. So I don't know what's the matter with me there. The but, spirit of Uncle Bud. Yeah. Well, well, hey, look, there you go. Mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit about yourself. You're a biologist, or, and you, you've, you're interested in a lot of things we are. Yeah, I think he's an ecologist, isn't he? Waterfowl ecologist is, mm-hmm. is what I would call myself. So Not so a broader, biologist. The, well, they're roughly the same, but more interested in how animals are interacting with Labels, labels, Bobby. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's, that's right. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's, well, awesome, you know, it's the dogs. wisdom, the knowledge, the insight, the experience. Not the not the labels. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Know-it-all. <laughs> well, you're, well, well, you're welcome. Thank you for <laughs> well, addressing me like that. So, we, uh, uh, look, you're from Arkansas, at the, at the, the Mon- Arkansas Monticello, is yep. that right? And you're, you're uh, what all do you do? Yeah, so I'm a researcher instructor. I'm working for the Five Oaks Ag Research and Education Center uh, through the University of Arkansas Monticello. So it's just a private-public kind of partnership with uh, Five Oaks Duck Hunting Lodge with the university. Uh, really getting at some some waterfowl and waterfowl habitat questions. Well, when we were preparing for this, Lanny, if you remember, mm-hmm. we, you know we've got redheaded Rob over here now oh, working yeah. and helping us, and it, and he put some questions out on right, the right. social media, and I, I was so impressed. Our listeners asked some fantastic questions. Mm-hmm. I mean, they really we got some smart listeners. No doubt. I don't know that we're going to have time to answer all these questions, but one of them was, "What's the difference in a biologist and, a, and an ecologist?" Yeah, that's that's a good question. I'm not sure I have a great answer, but yeah, ecologists are really more interested in the relationship of of the kind of organism, the animal, with the environment, interacting with the environment, whereas uh, biology kind of implies more focused on that organism. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's, oh, best. that's that's a good best. answer. I, I was going to say the answer. difference was like an E and a C versus a B and a I. <laughs> <laughs> That too, <laughs> yeah. It's just a, it's a one of those ologies. They're, That's the kind of question you like get in college, macro, where macro. you have to write the exact definition down of each. Yeah. So. And that's why I didn't do that's very well. That's one of those classes I didn't do in well in either. Mm-hmm. Well, we're gonna we're gonna talk about uh, migrations. We're gonna ask you about some red oak issues. We've got a lot to talk about. So uh, so before we get this thing started, Mike, you, uh, you over there? Are you texting? What do you got going on over there? But can. Yeah, well, that's a weather. good thing to do. Speaking I, of weather, if look, if we don't to. get some rain, no. uh, don't talk about it. Yeah. We got <sighs> good things on the horizon. Don't talk yeah. about it. Boy, it's, when your team has got a one-one lead in the ninth, do you talk about it? Does your pitcher got a no-hitter in the seventh? Do you talk about it? Don't talk well, about 
rainfall today. We've got okay. a home That's game. That's it. No more. No more okay. talk about it. Right. You right. right. Good gracious, Bob. So, Mac, would you? Uh, we've got a commercial. This podcast is brought to you by who? Apex Ammunition. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Buddy. yeah. He's in Columbus. Cool. Yeah. We're, we're, we talk about saving the ducks and duck habitat, but we also we, we also like shooting ducks too. And so they've they've actually partnered with Mossy Oak on this with a shattergrass habitat blend, which is still over tungsten. Uh, the box is super cool. I mean, they, they make a superior product. I mean, it's all hand-loaded uh, right across the river from us yep. over here in West Point. I mean, just great people, veteran-owned. Uh, and they're – I mean, I think their shells speak for themselves. Look, their shells are awesome. Hey, you shoot better with them, so, I mean, it makes you a better one. I, you know, I've seen Lanny be able to hit more ducks with them. That's yeah, for sure. If they adjust his aim, then they're worth the Hey, sh- showtime's coming up, buddy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Bobby, it, it is. Down there. I can't. <laughs> we always have so much fun. But, <laughs> yeah, but th- th- that's the, the Apex ammunition, guys. If you hadn't tried it, it's worth it's trying. It's amazing. I can vouch for it. I've used it in Canada, shot open weekend specs this past weekend, and it is amazing what that load will do. Toxie, did your phone ring? The- <laughs> Don't know. Oh, go, to go to, to, oh, go to Canada. Canada? No, not, right. at, not to Ohio, also either. Oh, oh. yeah. Uh, I was there too. He, he has he's on the trail. already, I like it. yeah, behind our back with some of our co-workers, some of our closest brethren. Yes, have shattered feathers uh, with him already. I, wow. I know who you're talking yeah. about. Uh-huh. I, I think he prevented that brethren from being on the podcast last week. As a matter of fact, good. I'm sure that's yeah. exactly when it went yeah. down. Yeah. Highly possible. Yeah. Highly possible. But I was a guest also, so I had nothing to say. All right. It. Had nothing to say. You could have <laughs> said no. <laughs> well, I yeah. could have had. Well, did I y'all did. have a good hunt? We did. We did. We had a great hunt. Uh, as a matter of fact, it, you don't think of northern Ohio as a waterfowling hotspot along the coast of Marsh, the Great Lakes, but it was yeah. it it's was amazing. Very amazing. Quite good. Quite any, good. Any jack minor bands in the? No jack minor bands, but I was looking for one. We killed a couple black ducks. Pintails, were, you had to be careful not to shoot too many pintails. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was really good. Those black ducks. Taxi, I always think about you said that when, when – I first moved here. You said we used to kill black ducks all the time. They it, were just almost as much as mallards. Yeah. I wonder what happened wow. with that. Did, mm-hmm. the f- no, I remember it too. Well, maybe we can get into Say that. In the eighties, there were lots of them around here. I mean, you see them every time you went. I think the first duck I killed was a black duck. Going back, the apex ammunition. I looked at guys, the, the detail and the thought these guys put into ammunition. Mm-hmm. I mean, the studies they're doing with this mm-hmm. stuff. I mean, next level. So yeah. Good stuff. So, moving on to blood on the biologic, there was one uh, thing that I wanted to point out. The state of Georgia has now made it legal to harvest or kill whatever you manage raccoons 12 months out of the year. Mm-hmm. So, good. Uh, that, that's a step in the right direction for our turkeys. Yeah, and, uh, that, that, you know, I don't think I realized you couldn't kill a turkey 12 months. I mean, kill a raccoon 12 no, months. you can't, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't realize. So, it happened. In Mississippi. Some states, I know, I remember hearing the podcast that Cuz did with Chuck, and he's like, that's one of the first things he did mm-hmm. when he kind of took over in Alabama. So I know that one's okay. I'm not sure about Mississippi. Yeah. I think they still have limitations, but they shouldn't be. Well, hats off to yeah. Georgia for doing that. And, 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 Chuck, if you did that in Alabama, hats off mm-hmm. to you there. Terry Jury, guys, killed a deer this past week. That's the biggest deer he's ever – and that's saying something. That is, that's, that, it, that is it, saying something. It, yeah. If it's when a jury and it's the biggest yeah, ever, it's yeah, big. It's big. 239 pounds after it was dressed. Wow. He, it, pushing 300 pounds. He, he referred to it as a slob. Yeah. When you said 239, I was fixing to hear net or something yeah, after that. Yeah. I was like, what? Yeah, I don't know what hook. it scored. I don't know what it scored. I yeah, think when you say slob, it. It's a big deer. It, it was a big deer. Wow. Mm-hmm. So, congrats to him. And there's a guy I wanted to give a shout out. I don't know this guy, but I like the way he's thinking. There's a guy in Minnesota that that uh, caught the state record muskie, and he released it. And I uh, he measured it. And now some of these states are allowing people to measure fish and then release so the fish doesn't have to be killed like it mm-hmm. used to have to be. Wow. So, I wanted to shout out to uh, Minnesota for allowing that. That's and this right. guy, his name – uh, is Eric Back. He That's caught cool. a 58 wow. and a half inch musky uh, wow. and, and measured it, did everything right, and then released it. So. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Congrats. Yeah. That's, that's no, most, up. most fishermen down here cut, catch a 58 inch musky, they're going to eat it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. down they catch in the a south. Four yeah. inch musky, they're going to eat it around there. Yep. Or a fish. Yeah. Uh, Dudley, you got anything to add to the blood on the biologic? Uh, Lanny, you got anything? 
Uh, Sam. Sam Culler's on the board. Yeah. He sure oh, is. Very, yeah. Go oh, Sam. Yeah. Oh, go imagine Sam. that. Yeah, imagine that. He's got a pretty good spot up there. I'd say. <laughs> so, got to gotta give a shout out to Sam. Deer had some cool character. What do you call it? The turkey foot buck or yeah, something? Yeah, turkey like that? foot buck. Turkey foot buck. So. Yep. Yeah. So, wish those guys well. Sure. All right. Before we start asking questions, one more thing I want to point out, Lanny. Can you tell me about this boatload of chips thing that's going Man, on? Man, look, we've got a great uh, promotion going on with our partners at Uncle Ray's and Sea Ark. So they're giving away a, a boatload of chips, literally. So it's a Sea Ark. It's got a Suzuki 25 on it, I believe. Uh, of course, better in Bottomland, all tricked out in Bottomland, and it comes with a bunch of chips. So uh, run to mossyoak.com. You can see the landing page there to get entered. Uh, to win. Yeah, know. and I mean, I have to shout out to Uncle Ray's. Oh, they're not, not only a great promotional partner, great business people, they make a great product. I, I just ate a half a bag before I came in here. I, honestly, when the samples came in, I mean, you know, I was expecting, you know, that it'd be pretty good yeah. or whatever, but they are really, really oh, good yeah. potato chips. Yeah, yeah. So okay. I have to give them a shout out. I'm, and I'm a – Actually, I gave up potato chips for Lent one year. That's how addicted I am every day, potato chip guy. So, uh, you like the I, obsessed or the bottom limb barbecue? Oh, yeah, the all you dressed. Like them all? The, the obsession. All dressed. Yes, yeah, those the are all good. dressed. The, bar- the barbecue is great. Yeah. But those all dressed are, and they're unique. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. They are those good. are delicious yeah. if you can find them somewhere. I like the We're going to send you all home cheese. with some. Yeah, mm-hmm. there you go. Yeah, Ryan, we'll get you some. Some, well, well, some, road, some fantastic. road food. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we, sure, we sure will. So, Mac, I want you to pay attention. I need you to join in. You're a very inquisitive person. But So, let's get this thing, thing started. I, I'd like to start with understanding the migration a little bit. And when these ducks start coming south, is it? what makes them decide to do so? Is it the length of the day? or what, Can you explain that, please? Yeah, yeah. so a lot of it's, it's – and – we talk in, in kind of straight lines a lot, but nature never works in straight lines. So this is kind of a generalization, but a lot of it's photo period. So they're sensing the day length and, and figuring out, uh, getting ready, kind of staging, prepping for that migration. But then the actual immediate cue a lot of times is is weather changes. Uh, that's right now. I mean, it's going to be like, what, 80 degrees here today? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. We're just not seeing. We've got a bunch of transmitters up in, in Canada and North Dakota, and they're just – they're Sit hanging still. out there. They're yeah. warm and happy right now. So I don't blame them. It's pretty hot yesterday. Yeah, I yeah. I, w- I wouldn't want to be down here if I were a mallard duck yet. Food plots appreciated though. So. Yeah. Do they wait as long as they can in in terms of staging with other ducks, or it, does it does it that freeze up there? Does it, you said photo period? So yeah. I, I'm listening. I'm yeah. not so paying we, attention to that, but yep. Yeah. So we we have some that are going to move with that photo period. Uh, Mr. Jody Pagan always calls them. Halloween ducks, so usually we get a good push of mallards into Arkansas uh, mm-hmm. right around Halloween, right around now. Uh, so they're kind of coming no matter what, whether it's freezing up there or not. And then there's there's just a gradient in between that. So there are some that are going to stay up there till till freeze up, till they get snow on the ground, and, and there are some that are just going to kind of start trickling down on their own. So it's it's the whole spectrum. There's also a, a got a buddy of mine has an opinion on the halfway point between the fall equinox and the winter solstice that that – Photo period time right there creates, and, and he can pick it on his farm year to year. He always gets a big influx of ducks and geese at that same time. So I think that's all calendar driven to some degree. Weather pushes that somewhat. Ryan and I talked about it all the way over here. The the difference between photo period and how weather helps drive that. Hmm. Interesting. So can you explain what you're talking about? Just well, you went through that so He's fast. He's a certified smart person. <laughs> I know, no, no, no. What would the that. date be this year? What is the date of that? I'd have to look. I, I'll look it up. So I was I was looking at our transmitter movements last year, and it I think it was right around November 10th last year is when a lot of our mallards were were really triggering that migration back south. So that's the midway point between. Oh, the, the you're talking midway point. point. Yeah. I, Okay. Hmm. So winter solstice is December 21st, right? Mm-hmm. It's always the shortest day of the year. So when is the fall equinox? It's has it just hit? It's September the 22nd. So September what's 22nd. that? Whatever that halfway point is. So case and short, so give a shout out to first case and short November. in the Bill Byers Hunter Farm. That's a uh, that's kind of their deal. That's when their numbers are typically the highest year in year out. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, that really is. So w- w- as these ducks start migrating south. Do they imprint on certain farms, certain areas, and then revisit those hi- historically? Is, is imprinting a big deal? Yeah, yeah, and I, I, I struggle using the term imprinting. But, yeah, I mean, they're incredible at, at really kind of a, assessing the benefit of a given side and being able to remember where, where they were able to get that good food, where they were able to escape pressure. And they're able to, to return to those same sites 
Uh, and we've, we've seen incredible uh, ducks and geese. I mean, returning to the same nest bowl, returning to the same migratory stopover. So, yeah, there's definitely, if, if they hit a good resource on the way down, then they're probably going to hit it again next year. Hmm. But as far as waterfowl is concerned, um, how many years would you need a, you know, a, a quality food source to really make a difference on imprint? Uh, a new property? Yeah, that's a great question. We were talking on the way up here. I mean, it, it seems like there is – historic uh kind of core use areas where ducks year after right. year are coming back even even when the landscape changes mm-hmm. uh, they're still going to come back to that same spot uh so it, it can last a long time i mean you can still lose it pretty quick if you lose that food in terms of like developing a new property yeah. it takes a couple of years uh especially in a lot of it depends on whether you're in kind of a wetland complex area sure, or, or, or if you have access or to if, yeah if, if you're, you're just kind of skirt. isolated mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I don't have a great answer to. It, it all depends. Yeah, we, we yeah. all, we yeah, know yeah. it all depends. <laughs> We're not in like a core complex, but we are certainly have our wetland yes. um, travel corridors here. It just seems like to me, watching it, totally unscientific, but for the last, at least intensively for, say, 20 years, there is a certain amount that are just coming. Come hell or high water, as long as we have water and food, you know, it doesn't matter how hot it is or anything. They're coming. And sometimes they show up just as early as we have water. And if we don't get a lot of weather, that's pretty much what we're stuck with, give or take some. Yeah. And then there's a lot more that are, like, going to come if they're forced to and aren't if they aren't forced to. And it seems to me, I even remember Dale telling me, he seems to think that that's more of a condition in the Mississippi flyway than any of them. Hmm. That, you know, his in his in his opinion, even of course he was a biologist by trade too, oh, yeah. that for that the ducks in the Mississippi Flyway just don't it, generally speaking, not an absolute here, generally don't a lot of them don't want to have to go any further south than they're forced to because the kind of foods we have with leftover ag don't weather the winter as well as a lot of native grasses huh. and foods and stuff. And so they're over time they've learned they're going back through a biological desert they go real far south now that was just his you know his philosophy i guess on it interesting but it does seem like every year and of course we're not as cold as we've been it just seems like we're getting more and more of that seems to be the trend there's some you're going to get and you know with the winters people in the far south they better be um treating with kidney gloves and not not worried about pound 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 or you're not going to have them yeah. yeah, sooner or later, right. you know, in my in my humble opinion. Mm. Now, maybe we'll have a really cold winter and it'll change back, but uh, the only time we've seen the big numbers here in the last three years was that super hard freeze in February. Yeah. Okay. And I thought we weren't going to have them again, and then we just were covered up for about a week. Mm. So, Ron, these uh, – we hear, you know, we're all, we all have these conversations when we're in the duck blind and we're not seeing many ducks or whatever. You know, there's a thought that maybe the people north of us, and I'm saying like Tennessee and southern Illinois and Missouri, are, are now planting so much stuff that these ducks aren't having to move down. As far. Is there can, any credence to that? Yeah, that's, that's something that uh, we're looking at with research uh, a lot right now. So just kind of anecdotally from our transmitter data it's it's amazing how many kind of warm water habitats and and dry feeding ducks have anyways up there so we have so many transmitters that stop on like power plant cooling lakes uh even like settling ponds for Hmm. for local sewage treatment plants Uh, (laughs) so that's something we've definitely definitely talked about looking at how kind of stopover habitat use on fall migration how much of that's actually like planted flooded corn like everybody talks about in the south and how much is is other habitat and it's I mean, they're incredibly adaptable, so they're good at good at finding food and avoiding avoiding risk. So it's it's kind of like what Toxie's saying is, they can stay north and kind of hold out there and get the food they need and and not have to move further south. And I I don't know how much of that is actually being influenced by planting versus just food on the landscape. Hmm. Do you have an opinion? I I do. <laughs> uh, I I don't think it's influencing duck movements in a serious way. I think I think disturbance and and i mean basically predation risk hunter risk of harvest mortality in the south it's probably a bigger driver of pushing them up there as opposed to stuff holding them there but and i mean there's i think it's hard to argue that we haven't seen some 
kind of changes in weather patterns and the amount of snow that we're getting at those latitudes. So yeah. we got to step yeah. in and say <clears throat> we have one of the foremost turkey biologists, not only up to date, but of all time. And I won't even have to call his name, people know. But he said the number one influencer, hunting pressure. Mm. And then we had deer now recently. And the number one influencer changed to talk turtle to not – hunting pressure and then we have him here today and he's telling us clearly and he's obviously spent his life in research not just you know watching things like us hunting pressure so everybody need you know sooner or later you need to listen and how we approach makes such a big difference in not only the our enjoyment of the resource but the perpetuation that we love in conservation 100%. of the resource good point yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. So to that, it, the, being the ecologist that you are, do you have an opinion on how a guy should approach hunting? Should it be, should a property only be allowed to be hunted once or twice a week, or, or are there you have ideas there? Yeah, yeah, we're uh, we're looking at a lot of that with research. So we've got research going on in White River, looking at sanctuary use by one of our graduate students, and we're kind of looking at that in the private realm as well. And I mean, ideally, if you have a big enough property, you just leave a part of that property alone and just leave that as called inviolate sanctuary. You don't go in there. You never disturb them. You don't drive past them. You just leave them there. Uh, if, if you don't have that, having kind of temporal sanctuary, so only hunting, like, say, two or three days out of the week is good. Uh, but really, ideally, kind of the rule is you, you leave 80% and you hunt 20 Uh in my opinion, would be would be the best. I know that's not just not possible. Wow, most people, I love but. hearing that though because yeah. that's been my that's what we need to talk about. My yeah. my love is having them yeah. over shooting them, and so yes, and you know if you don't have them, you can't shoot them. So that makes a lot of sense because more and more we're trying to develop small holes, so you don't have to have a lot of ducks right. have a super quality hunt. You don't have to shoot over thousands of them, mm-hmm. you know, and. So that makes a ton of sense. So the bigger places become, obviously, the sanctuaries. Kind of yeah. got a couple of them now. We don't want to. Yeah. And I, I think that's one of the ways people have asked, how do you have duck hunting where you are? Not even. Well, that's probably a big, big part of it. Y'all yeah. have witnessed it. No, your pressure management. Yeah. You've always yeah, mentioned yeah. that pressure. Yeah. 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 Pressure yeah. management's huge. huge. Not only hunting, but d- just disturbance. You know, yeah. one of the issues yeah. people yeah. have, they want to go ride and look at them. So oh, they yeah. go get no. in the truck, go ride, and go, hey, let's go look at the ducks. Let's go get the ducks up. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. Man, <laughs> leave cow. them. Well, these new cell cams, like, 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 you know, a Spartan Go Live, yeah. you could put it on a oh, place yeah. and be able to click and more look and see. More and more folks are using that technology for waterfowl as folks done for deer for a long mm-hmm. time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Honestly, I'm not so sure that that Spartan Go Live might not be, the, other than surveillance of your property from someone breaking in, like putting them on duck holes might be the number one most useful thing. Yeah. Because you're right. Just, on the live. It's like, sure. you know, y'all know how adamant hey. and how good Neil is at the duck thing. And, you know, scouting and picking the right spot. I and mean, Max run with him. He knows too. But I was like, I always ask, did you get them up? I said, well, yeah, I had to. Because, I mean, there's corn there or tall grass or, you know. We could, I wouldn't have known how many were there without getting them up. I said, man, I don't get them up. We get back and forth in that all the time. And he, <laughs> he does know it's best not to get them up. So that camera would be so nice. That's exactly what I'm going to use the mm-hmm. one I've got for yeah. and hopefully get a couple more to do it with. Yeah. So, I'll, Dudley, I want to get to you next. Mm-hmm. But before, I, I want to stay on this theme real quick, Jim. I'm looking at you. The state of Arkansas. So once that season comes in, there's a – and I'm thinking about public land hunt. Can they hunt every day yes. on, on like a biometer or something? Yes. Would would the public, do you think, if research from what uh, like Ryan's doing down the road, if it said, hey, we just need to hunt this three days a week, do you think the the people would take, would they respond to that? And We have areas like that now, White River Refuge. There's parts of White River Refuge you can only hunt certain days per week. All of our public areas pretty much shut off at noon. you got to be out of there by 12 o'clock. Um, on the state areas, they've got it to where non-residents can only hunt three different 10-day periods. So they're trying to reduce pressure that way. I don't know that you'll ever get that through in the state of Arkansas on a WMA or on a GTR where you can only hunt three days per week, generally general public. But there will be areas that they'll have it limited to that to keep pressure down. And you can see where pressure is limited, duck use is up mm-hmm. heavily. I, sure. would, I, I would love to... 
have some brave state somewhere or federal government even do it and take an area and say, you know, maybe they, they don't limit it to three days a week, but maybe, maybe it's three days a week. I don't care. But say, and you, you said, you, you made me think about it when you said n- not after lunch. It's like nobody can put a boat in or go hunting until 8 o'clock in the morning. I'd love to see how that affected the continued use. Because my own philosophy, again, unscientific, is what I've seen is like if you go and you're there before daylight and the first thing that shows up and you're pounding them, you're pounding them, and you gotta got to have that limit so we just stay on and on and on into the morning, you move. The, they're going somewhere else. they got to eat. Especially if it's really cold, they got to go eat something, and they're gone. You've, you've moved them. If you go in, and I mean, so like our stuff, where we have stuff planted in their feet, and you go in at like eight o'clock or maybe, well, they've already had a chance to feed there, and they're a lot less bothered by you riding up, you know, on your uh, ATV and throwing your decoys out and stuff than they are you pounding, shooting at them. Plus, your first couple of shots in the morning isn't over every duck coming there. So I don't know. I would just curious. I'd love to see someone do a specific research project just to ban the daylight hunting. And I know I, every, I love that first crack of daylight. Everybody yeah. duck hunts yeah. loves it. Oh, yeah. Be interesting to see. Like you 8 know, to 12. You yeah, can only just, shoot from 8 to 9. Yeah, something like That'd that. Or maybe 8 to 2. Let them stay longer. You know, but, but eliminate that first daylight. Because I feel like what we're doing it here is we're just more and more and more. We're training them to be nocturnal. And that's just yeah. my own. Tra- tra- training saying. is the key word there. Yeah. So it'd be interesting to see what would happen if you didn't start until eight. Well, o'clock. every That'd, every yeah. person we have on that has that scientific lifestyle uh, research background, it it comes out saying the same thing, and it's like the laws of the universe, not just our Earth. There, nature adapts. No matter what, nature is going to always adapt. That's just the way it's cre- this whole world's created. So you got to use that in your to, you know your your tool your box of your tool tools box. for managing wildlife and understand in every single case nature will adapt and what does that mean a thousand different things depending on what you're doing in the species well one thing i think what you're saying there we talked about on the way over here evolution is ongoing it yes. doesn't quit mother nature's always as we get better she gets better you know so that you always got to keep that in mind moving forward i think mm-hmm. yeah why i ever thought that that didn't apply to hunting and wildlife i don't know yeah. that was just <laughs> yeah. but i mean everybody should wake up and realize nature adapts and this that should be a, a buzzword in your mind when you're you know planning the hunting or you know working on your place and it's going to happen mm. and uh, everything we talked about today says that screams it actually dudley you got a question well i'm i'm looking at some of these uh questions from our listeners and uh wanted to get that rolling possibly um, so I've got one from Breck Cherry, and he said, I'd like to hear a breakdown of how night migration works. How do waterfowl navigate at night? Great question. Yeah, that, that is a great question. Something a uh, few people have looked at. I haven't looked at closely, so I'm, I'm definitely not the expert on this. Uh, but it's, I mean, there's, there's definitely the ability to migrate at night, and there's some theories about why they're doing that, whether it's to avoid avian predators like peregrines, uh, there's there's trade-offs, obviously. You're able to find food during migration if you're migrating during the day and, and stop over and like things like that. I think with, with ducks specifically, their ability to kind of sense where they are and use use landmarks. And you think about, I mean, even waterways are pretty, pretty obvious, uh, especially at night if there's any moonlight, mm-hmm. uh, that they can still kind of navigate with those and use some of those landscape uh, kind of points to, to base that migration on and then find suitable habitat where... I mean, they're really looking for water, and that has some sort of reflectance that they're able to pick up and and make it in. Uh, but yeah, it's incredible, incredible ability to to do so. It's so amazing along, how that works. Along those same lines, so if a if a duck was at the border of of America and Canada, and picked up and started flying south, is there some data that shows? Do they prefer to fly at night, and then how far would they? in a day's time would they travel yeah we uh kind of everywhere between stopping every 50 miles to being able to make that whole jump from from canada north dakota all the way to arkansas uh, wow. I've, I've worked a lot more with with speckle bellies and and canada geese in illinois and even their ability so jumping from the arctic down to prairies in canada and then 
all of our speckle bellies flew straight from Prairie Canada to uh, the Arkansas Delta down into Louisiana, or even I was talking with somebody earlier, I guess Rob, uh, about the speckle bellies hitting Mississippi and Alabama. It's like they get caught in the jet stream and mm-hmm. get dumped out over here and then make their way back to the Delta the next day. Uh, so really – Yeah, because really our, cool. our prevailing jet streams are going to be – west to east but then that's also kind of northwest to southeast and sometimes dead out of the north on behind these fronts so rarely do we get one going back to the west but so um you know makes sense when they get in a jet stream i mean it won't take a couple of hours yeah i mean you got a hundred and something mile back you know at their back it's just like flying in an airplane yeah or Mm -hmm. faster so they're covering some ground there yeah y'all have a uh, pintail with a transmitter a couple years ago that went from like somewhere way up northern Saskatchewan to Benson Lake, like in a 36 hour period yeah. or something like yep. that. Yeah. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah, it's, it's, it can be a matter of days. I mean, their, their ability, especially with those, those, uh, winds at altitude. Yeah. I mean, they're just so efficient. Flyers. I wonder how, I wonder how high can, that was going, that's a good question. How high can they get yeah. and still, you know, cause obviously at a certain height, we can't breathe, mask, you know? Mask, yeah. 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 You know, our, our transmitter is, give us altimeter uh readings and they're not super accurate they're based on on that gps connection right uh, but that's something i need to look at with our mallets i know with canada geese we had a few that i think were migrating like a thousand feet uh, oh that's nothing i've known they're going higher than that yeah, yeah. that's yeah. that's not they much but yeah i don't know about these mallets i bet you it's it's high wow interesting stuff there, yeah you got another one dad um well mac have you got one I do. Uh, so w- w- we think about turkeys, we think about how well <clears throat> that they can see. <clears throat> how how well can ducks see and, and kind of how does their eyesight work as far as like on a, on a scientific level? I mean, I know ducks can see and I mean, yeah. we, we kick a lot of water so they can see that, but uh, the reflections and things like that. But like, what is, can you compare a duck's eyesight to? I guess? Yeah, they, they just see way beyond the same color spectrum we do. So they're seeing into that UV spectrum. Uh, and there's there's some really neat research out of songbirds and stuff that's looked at that. There's a lot less with ducks, but we kind of assume that that most birds are are pretty similar. But their ability to pick out UV reflection and just reflection in general. We were talking about materials on the way on the way over here, and and how different materials have different UV reflectance, and and I mean into that light spectrum that we just can't sense. And they they definitely have a way. I I take a lot of pictures and. I was all excited. Got a new ghillie blanket that had kind of some artificial fiber and and had a good cypress break that I was getting set up that had a bunch of mallards and I lay down, kind of snuggled down in between some cypress knees and the first first pair came in and just it was like they saw a ghost and I mean to me this this ghillie blanket looked incredible but there was some some reflectance from that that I mean it just they picked that out immediately even though I was tucked back into some really dark that's that's really area. interesting I, you know i know there was a lot of research with deer yes. where folks were you know mm-hmm. wash your clothing in this to, so yeah. is that a similar uv type thing that yeah you, yeah i i think so and i don't think we've really explored it no. that well but i i i personally believe it because you can yeah. when you're you know in your clothing especially today with all the synthetic great fibers right. people i honestly if you're and Jim may have noticed this too, if you're sitting in the woods right at daylight, you can see if your clothing is it's just there's something about that first period of light where you can see light just jumping off of it almost. Yeah, and sure. and it's Except you know for yeah, we used to test it with the uh, black light because that's you know UV reflectance. Yeah. I guess it, it's, it's, it is word. absolutely no doubt. It, it do, I have no doubt yeah. about it. That yeah. especially you know I'm thinking about turkeys. Yeah, turkeys, and, ducks, and, deer, and so critters in general. We at the time the by far and away the best material for camouflage clothing was all cotton, mm-hmm. and the stuff that had synthetic fibers in it reflected a lot more UV light. And so I know there's been. Some universities do some pretty extensive research, but also had heard they kind of tabled it to not try to draw any undue, you know, bad conclusions about certain, you know, clothing companies and stuff. But honestly, the truth is the truth. I'd love to know what that truth is. I'd love for us to be able to make a better product if that's necessary using something. But um, Well, it would behoove all of us yeah. on this side of the fence, no doubt. Yeah. I, you know, I – it makes so much sense. I mean, how can my dogs are in, we're at home, 
and it's black dark, no moon or anything, and they bark and realize that, you know, it was a deer 200 yards. They could see it in the black dark out the window. I mean, they literally have to be able to see Mm-hmm. A different part of the light spectrum. So, I mean, we've pretty much proven that. Yeah. Well, talking yeah. about dogs, sure. we, here's here's another one. You take a dog with some hunting experience, retriever, yeah. duck hunting experience, and you cripple a miter drake in twelve dozen miter decoys, and they can pick out that oh, cripple yeah. amongst all them decoys instantly. So, instantly. So you can't tell me they can't see in a little different spectrum than what we do. We may go, man, that's a cool looking decoy. That's a really cool looking camouflage. Look how it mm-hmm. blends with this or that. Mm-hmm. Well. Them critters are seeing it way different than we are. I oh, think that's wow. important. Yeah, and yeah. probably, you know, I hadn't thought about that because one of the things I talk about all the time is in the first hour or so, it's almost impossible to hide from them, no matter what we're in. How many times have and I'm not so him? sure yeah. that it's the difference in the decoys and the UV, you know, for lack of a better word, reflectance would be so much more dramatic in the wee hours. And then once you get a full bright sunlight, it kind of goes away and I don't have yeah, those exactly. issues anymore. Mm. And I've never understood why, because we'd be in blinds that are hidden so good. And honestly, there's more bright light for us to show up in the middle of the day. And I realize there's a little shadow cast and all that, but it's, it's, it's unbelievable how spooky they are in the dim light early on. And I'm not, maybe that's it. Maybe the, the difference in the decoys not looking real is more dramatic in the dim light. I don't know. That's something – that'd be a great topic for research, yeah. too. I, but, you know, I remember still the the father of all this camouflage, my buddy Jim Crumley, they used to ask him about it all the time. He said, well, until we get deer to talk, we'll never know for sure. <laughs> <laughs> that's so, a, good, a, that's a dang thing. good point. Yeah. yeah. But that I bet you we could today's – Technology could figure out what's going on mm-hmm. with the duck and the deer and the turkey, and I bet you it's very, very similar. Yes. I bet you it is. Hmm. Dudley, what you got one ready? All right, so um, we're kind of shifting here. Jay Ballard, sixteen, uh-huh. wants to know how do you view the "don't shoot hens" opinion? Yeah, this, this is <laughs> something wow. we even talked about before there. we started recording. Uh, this is this is a tough one, and it kind of goes into whether harvest is additive versus compensatory. So basically, whether harvest is actually uh, decreasing the population, or if that that harvest is being compensated for by by increased production. So for it to be compensatory, you have to have density dependence, which basically just means there's limited resources, and those resources are limiting the number of ducks. Uh, so that's really what's constraining the population instead. For the most part, we think that harvest on ducks is compensatory. So it's usually compensated for by basically having more ponds for th- those ducks that do survive. And we, we know we're shooting ducks that are less healthy and probably less likely to go back and breed anyways. So it's decreasing the number of, of ducks out there and, and allowing those surviving ducks to go nest. Uh, in these dry years, like we've seen the last last couple of years at least, that, that might differ. I, I'm not deep enough into that side of things to really have a strong opinion. Uh, I mean, I love to shoot drakes. I think it's, I mean, it's kind of a challenge for me to, to pick out drakes and, and when things are going really well, uh, I'd, I'd prefer to only shoot drakes. Yeah. But if you're having a rough hunt, I, it's not the end of the world. I don't think if you shoot a hen and, and especially on these, these boom years, when we do get wet years, it's, it's, harvest probably isn't going to make any difference on the population so. yeah hmm. that, that's that's interesting jim go ahead i've, I've got a, <clears throat> i've got another angle there Talk, okay. um shoot them and get out of there and leave them alone disturbance pressure disturbance pressure management if you got opportunity if you need two ducks to finish the limit and two mounted hens shoot them and get out of there and let the ducks have it back it's mm-hmm. kind of my theory but i'm looking at it more from a pressure management yeah managing hunting property or something like that so go on and get them and get out you know shoot stay within the limits don't don't go crazy, but I'm all, I would say go and shoot them and get out of there. Yeah, and that's looking through some of these questions. There's a lot on kind of shifting, uh, if there's northward shift, if ducks are, are short stopping. I think a lot of what we're seeing, what we need to think a lot more about is is how pressure is influencing duck movements and recruitment and, and distribution. Yes. Yeah, and basically where they're going on the landscape. And I think that has a, a huge impact, absence of kind of that mortality of, of the effect on population and and hunter success so it's like illinois central illinois i mean there are areas that uh we were 
reporting aerial survey numbers with Forbes Biological Station, and we'd have people, I mean, just cussing us, saying we're making these numbers up. And it's because they're hunting these public areas really heavily hunted. They wouldn't see a duck all morning, even though there's 30,000 just sitting a mile, a mile and a half right. from them that only come out to feed it at sunset, that they're yeah. just never there in the afternoon to see them. And it's pressure pressure, and how that's kind of changed how smart ducks are. I, I'm not sure I'd call it evolving, but but it's it's influencing their behaviors uh, to major pan, sure. yeah, and sure. it's yeah. it's it's influencing influencing hunter success and how hunters are perceiving duck Na- populations. Nature adapts, yeah. every time. Yep. Mm-hmm. Landy, yep. you've got a question? Oh yeah, well, yeah. I always have a question about ducks. <laughs> uh, you know, I think we've touched a little bit on on time frame to migrate. And we've talked a little bit about pressure, and then we talked about the northern crops. So what I'm I'm hearing from you, you know, and we we say this a lot of times here. We're like, oh. They pressured them too hard up north before they got there. Is that a possibility? I, I'd say it's a possibility. Uh, so one of the the most interesting points I've heard is that we know that younger birds uh, are spreading out across the mm-hmm. landscape more. So that's where we think that possibly increase harvest, especially of juvenile, uh, especially juvenile females up north. Maybe with spangwing decoys, we know they're more susceptible. Uh, we think that could be where we're seeing a kind of decrease in mallard harvest, mm-hmm. especially in Louisiana. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's been thrown around. I don't know if there's validity to that. I don't know how you test that. But no, I, I, I think it's a possibility that, yeah, the, the amount of hunting up north could influence. Uh, less so the population, but the distribution. We certainly, <laughs> yes. the very first week or so of our season, hunt a different duck than what we no hunt. No doubt. Oh, yeah. You know, starting at say Christmas and on, yeah, no question. They're like they're so much spookier, and you know, I don't know if that's because surely the more hunting pressure they've had that year in older ducks, yes, sir. You know, yeah. have to be. It has to make a difference. Yeah, yeah. we so, sure blame it on. Yeah. <laughs> so, as a researcher, is there something that you've learned about ducks that like surprised you? Hmm. Ooh, ooh, there are lots of things, and and. I go back to geese. I'll try to focus on ducks. The The home range. I mean, how little some of these ducks will move uh, hmm. is incredible. And, again, it's going back to, to adapting So to where we have this really heavily pressured landscape in southeast Arkansas, the Stuttgart area, uh, around Five Oaks. Uh, there's pressure all over the place. And some of those ducks, I mean, they're not moving more than two miles from from their roosting site almost wow. the entire winter i mean they're moving so little they need, they're finding food sources where they know they're safe and they're just going back and forth to that hmm. uh, till they till they run out of food basically uh, so that's been really really fascinating to me the relationship with bombland hardwoods uh, i think is really interesting and that's something i'm looking at so we're trying to figure out uh, really use ducks these transmitters to inform management of bombland hardwoods so figure out what forest characteristics uh, things like stem density, uh, these thickets, and, and even tying in some behavioral data. So we have accelerometers in these these transmitters that I brought, and we can infer behaviors from that. So we can we can look at how that transmitter is moving in three axes, and we can go back and, and kind of separate those out and figure out what movements relate to what behaviors. So whether they're, wow. say, feeding, whether they're flying, whether they're resting. And we're really starting to, I'm starting to tease apart how different forest characteristics are related to behaviors. That's of fast. Oh, mm-hmm. I can't wait to see that. <laughs> yeah, no yeah. doubt. No, it's it's really neat stuff, and I'm really fortunate to be down there. Uh, so, just as time. an opinion for now, how important is a, a flooded timber place to have some cover, like some thick cover, as opposed to all big, beautiful red oaks, raining, lots of food? You know. Yep. Yep. I. Th- I think it's really important, and that's that's one of the interesting things we're finding out. So we're we're right next to Biomeda, so obviously a really yeah. heavily pressured, yes. just massive expanse of, of bombland hardwood. So our ducks, if if you look at selection, so basically the proportion of, of locations in timber compared to what's theoretically available to them, they're actually avoiding timber, but a lot of that's being driven by Biomeda, we think, right. because of the hunting uh, pressure. Right. Yeah. Here, uh, so it's it's definitely important to have a, a heterogeneity of habitats, have a diversity, and it's it's like with pretty much all wildlife management. 
Uh, so yeah, thickets in your kind of in your big woods, even bunbush sloughs yeah. are incredibly yeah. important for loafing and roosting. Huge. Uh, that's actually one of the areas we've we're seeing the highest selection for is is these reservoirs and stuff around us where they're they're loafing. Do you uh, think that do you think that it just seems like more and more that uh, especially I don't know mallards especially because we key on them. They just, if they were feeding in open water in places, they get in there, they get full, and they're headed. They want something overhead. Like, yeah. is it that they fear the hawks and eagles more yeah. and more? Yeah. Because they just seem, some ducks can just sit out on wide open spaces all day long. doesn't seem to bother them. But the mallards especially want to go not just in the timber. I think they like it for the cover. Yeah. And so you get a lot of the stuff we have around here, that buck mm-hmm. brush he's talking mm-hmm. about, or button brush or whatever it's called. Yeah. You know, I can remember by – managing with the crop duster we eliminated and i think we eliminated too much of it yeah yeah in some places but some of the places we have had really really good hunts there's no rhyme or reason except it had that overhead cover (laughs) they had an open hole to land in but then immediately they could swim out into stuff with a real dense over over canopy yeah yeah and i think you're spot on with that avian predator i think it's the eagles and the hawks we have a lot of folks get button bush from us and they'll strategically plant it wow um in their you know impoundments but what they're doing is it will take over an impoundment but they right. go in and mulch right. holes out of it and the well, ducks easy, like to land in the open and then swim under the it'd be easy to control bush. if you if you can control the water it'd be pretty easy to yeah. go in there and control it so i was wondering i let some you know it's a real invasive but the um Cespania, i guess yeah gets pretty tall in cover i don't i wonder if that's enough in some of these wide open spots i left a couple of places this year where i left you know a pretty good size open hole and i'd leave a couple of, like an acre or two per spot that yeah. i left it. i just left it yeah no i i think there's absolutely nothing wrong with that i think i think that provides vertical cover i mean we know it's not really providing food value but that no. vertical cover no. is is crucial and you think about kind of noise abatement i mean planting screens around houses it's the oh, same yeah. thing with ducks to where if you have that vertical cover and you know right. the wind blowing through that shots are gonna spook them way less it's gonna stress them out way less if they've got something kind of knocking that noise down a little bit hmm. that, that really is interesting Go ahead, uh, I, I was gonna say I'd, I'd like to get into some food type stuff yes. um, and uh, mm-hmm. a guy named taylor bobo said do, do ducks actually use the flooded timber for a food source or is that more to loaf and rest um can't wait but to hear that. I'd one. like to evolve on some of that too. Yeah, yeah. They they definitely use it for a food source. Obviously, red oak acorns are big. Uh, we're doing a lot of research. So again, with the transmitters, we're looking at forest composition, so red oak composition in those woods to look at where they're using in the woods and if red oaks are more more prevalent there or not. We're also using uh, meta barcoding DNA techniques with their poop essentially from harvested birds to look at what composition of their diet is. Hmm is red oak acorns and vertebrates uh, versus moist soil seeds or like agricultural grains. That's great. Uh, that's going on right now. Wow. Yeah, yeah, wow. it's it's processing. So That's uh, incredible. Yeah, yeah, it yeah it's it's really neat technology. I'm really excited to see the results. Mm. Uh, so yeah, there it's it's definitely multiple multiple use. So there's there's definitely good food sources in there, uh, but that that structure is also really important like like he's asking. I mean it's really important for loafing and resting and getting away from avian predators. Um, and there seem to be there a, lot lot of, more, a lot more avian predators now than ever. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I, I've always been interested in all of that, especially, uh, you know, I'm a tree guy, but the moist soil stuff really interests me. And mm-hmm. when I was younger, it seemed like consensus was more broadleaf stuff like smart weeds and things. And then uh, it changed to more, you know, grassy, you know, sedges and grasses as being what everybody wanted to manage for, is that still what? Uh, it's. I go back to heterogeneity again. Uh, a little bit of each is really important, especially so we focus so much on, on managing for mallards, but those sedges and some of those smaller seeds, uh, there's really not a lot of species that will eat, eat even, say, millet. Uh, like pintails, green wings are really selecting for those really small seeds, uh, like red root flat sedge. Oh, panic grass, uh, some of those smaller seeds. So, yeah, having that, that mixture is really important. Of course, mallards love millet. They're kind of generalists, so they do pretty so well on So, we call one sprangletop. Yep. How good is it? 
Uh, it's pretty. It's it's good. It doesn't produce as much seed abundance as. You know, as it's funny though. There's a there's a there's a maybe a there's two types or the soil, but some of them um, put on a huge head. Some of them are short, and some of them are you know whatever three four feet tall and put on. And that's is that just the how perfect growing conditions, rich soil, or is yeah, there two different yeah, types? It could be, and there's a few other grasses that look I. Okay. I, and I'm, I'm not great with my moist soil plants. I need to be a lot better. But there are a few others that, that look pretty similar to Sprangle Top. It, it seems to be more and more like invasive. Of course, what you, like you want, you know, it's like barnyard grass is the, the gold standard, you know, when you start looking at all that. And the, one yeah. of the best thing could have, it's very invasive. And I say bring it on, you great know. So, yep, yeah. yep. Mallards love it. Yep. We have a lot. And that's kind of our, that's our, fallback position yeah. i'm not so sure we don't get just as much help from all the barnyard grass we raise as all the stuff we plant but you know because it is millet it's basically the foot yeah it's just yep. wild millet so yep right yeah that's i i'm a big proponent for moist soil management i mean it provides a just incredible diversity of, of nutritional needs mm -hmm. for I, i'd love to have more broadleaves the the pennsylvania smart which is about the only really beneficial one yeah. i know to kind of let go but in our world, there's so many invasive, n good for nothing broadleaves, and of course, yeah. by nature, broadleaf means shades everything out. So we just, in a lot of cases, we have to manage to get rid of them, or we don't have anything. So yeah, right. we don't have the opportunity right. to really manage towards. It. There's something about the Pennsylvania smart wheat here that comes on strong really, really late in the, even into the fall. In the and so that period, or in the. No, I mean, like, in, I mean, it barely shows up in, like, September, late oh, August. Huh. And it'll be making flowers, like, even to, like, you know, on into October. And it seems like stuff has been suppressed, and it just really takes off late, late in the year. And I'll get a stand of it in, like, the, the pond at the cabin. There's mm -hmm. probably three acres solid of that. And it just kind of took over mm -hmm. late in the year. I don't know why. Maybe some water got on the other. You know, some some water standing will suppress weeds. You know, yeah. But and let other there ones are take some off. weeds. Yeah, there are some weeds that can can really take advantage of that standing water. The interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, you know, I want to get onto some tree stuff too. But uh, you know, we were talking about red oak acorns, and then I also hear a lot of talk about just the leaves falling out of an oak tree is a a, a good way to hold invertebrates. Um, you know, whereas, you know, you've got ag fields that are just mud bottoms, but there's stalks that they can hang right. out on. And right. uh, it's, it's just so interesting. But it seems like diversity wins. Every yeah. time. Yeah. Well, and it's, I mean, I think I'm, I kind of come from a holistic perspective, uh, thinking about the broad ecosystem. And I think managing for those things helps us, I mean, get cleaner waters, manage all these ecosystem services on top of helping helping provide food for ducks so yeah that leaves and bombland hardwoods more invertebrates more uh aerobic anaerobic processes that are influencing water quality and all sorts of other things that i think are really meaningful stuff. yeah yeah you think it, about the protein there too you know yeah better feather structure eggshells going on the flyback spring nesting all that comes into play so yeah you need a little all of it yeah and there's there's some discussion we're still figuring out how important invertebrates are and again with this diet study that's one of the things we're we're hoping to look at there's some evidence that it's it's mixed i mean it's some studies have kind of suggested that invertebrates are super important that they're already building those proteins that they're they're probably really important for building back proteins once they arrive here on migration because sometimes they're catabolizing protein out of their muscles. So to build that back is important. But then when do they really need that calcium in protein when they start heading back north and whether it needs to be here or on those stopover areas uh, is a big question. It's just so interesting how adaptable they are. You know, I, I'm, I grew up on the Mississippi Flyway and, you know, 500 years ago that was nothing but cane breaks and red oaks and sweet gums and and now it's almost nothing but agriculture yeah. and they've they've completely adapted to that yeah yeah and that's geese geese are incredibly adaptive and mallards i mean to a large extent too they're they're generalists and that's we were having some discussions on the way over here on on what historic waterfowl populations looked like and and how this kind of agricultural dominated landscape has changed 
those population levels. And we know like with snow geese that that agriculture in the Mississippi Louisville Valley and and north has just allowed them to explode mm-hmm. essentially. And mm-hmm. same with speckle bellies to some extent and, and whether or not that's the case with mallards as well. So interesting. So would nocturnal behavior be something that they've adapted to? It's it's probably something that's always been there to some degree. Uh, like I think they probably always had the ability to feed nocturnally. Uh, one, because avian predators are predominantly diurnal. I mean, great horned owls, barred owls might take ducks, but really eagles and peregrines are, are what we think the main waterfowl predators are. So that, I mean, that could have even before kind of modern hunting uh, could have been influencing that pattern to some extent. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it just seems to me, even in my short life and the short time I've been on this earth, that, that it's, it's definitely moving more of that, that nocturnal pattern than, you know, Lenny, I know, I know historically. it has for me. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it, well, look, I want to just kind of ask this question. It's a little off the wall, but uh, in England, they hunt ducks at night over there. Yeah. As an ecologist, what's going on? Why, why are they doing that? And what's the... Yeah, they, they definitely have a different take on game management than we do that I know you guys are familiar with and, and talk about uh, to where it is really the resource of, of the wealthy and nobility. Right. Uh, and Yeah, I... I mean, it's definitely effective. It sounds like you can, yeah. well, there's can shoot no a lot of ducks if you're shooting after after dust. I, but. Yeah, I mean, they can't manage for. I mean, they can't be trying to shoot drakes. Uh, and it's just I don't. I, it doesn't make sense. To yeah, me. I don't know. Yeah, why but they, it's waterfowl hunting over there is just at such a small scale that it probably isn't having a meaningful impact at the population level yeah. compared to the number of hunters we have here. Well, that's good to know. So I, I, I've just always scratched my head. At yeah, that. It, it, it is interesting. Yeah, it is. So, I, you know, I think we, we've hit on something here, kind of a, a chord that makes sense to me, but managing this hunting pressure, however you guys are trying to learn about it more, Toxie has certainly oh, figured out some things man. himself. Lanny, we see it our, our, from just from being around him and yeah. places. But, uh, Jim, you're shaking your head. Obviously, you agree that it's a big part. It's a huge part. It's a huge part. The deal is we all like to hunt them. We all like to watch them. We all like to be a part, so you want to go get in a boat and go riding and scouting in the afternoons. And uh, we got some federal areas, big large tracts of woods. It's federal. It's on refuge property. You can't necessarily hunt waterfowl hunt in the afternoon, but you can bow hunt, you can squirrel hunt, you do whatever. So people want to go get in a boat and go scout. Well, you're running ducks out of the woods in the afternoon, and then you wonder why the next morning it, you're not as productive. Mm-hmm. And the better we can manage that, the better I think we're going to be with the opportunity to. to Increase harvest and increase hunting pleasure while hunting and let ducks use those habitats. Yeah, yeah. And we're we're looking to inform a lot of how we kind of design those those the timing of hunting in those refuges, the spatial aspect of hunting in those refuges. So Ethan Dittmer uh, with the Osborne Lab at UAM has been working on White River, and what he's finding is that ducks are actually using the the spatial sanctuary, so the areas that they can only hunt in the morning the same as just a regular like free for all hunted area uh, to where really that spatial sanctuary that that no afternoon hunting really doesn't seem to be making a difference they're mm. they're still avoiding that the same as pretty much all the hunted areas uh, wow. so thinking about if we need to time that like we talked about earlier just two days a week and then just leave whole days or whole blocks that they aren't allowed to hunt or if if that morning hunting is meaningful and and I mean, we can increase the hunter, hunter effort and, and access if we allow them to hunt in the afternoons. I mean, how many people can't wake up at 2 a.m. to go to a public boat launch and hunt a morning but could go hunt in the afternoon? I would think there are a number of private places in Arkansas that probably really manage their hunting pressure that you guys could learn from if, if there was a way to. Several. We're both around a lot. You know, have no hunting past 10 o'clock. Some are past 9 o'clock. You don't have them by 9. You're out. Let yep. the ducks have them the rest of the day. So, Toxie, when I first moved here a long time ago, there were these older men, Clark Young being one of them. Big that, duck. And they they typically would not go hunting. They would hunt almost every day, but they wouldn't go till about 8 o'clock in the morning. 7, 8 o'clock, yeah. And, eight, eight, yep. And so, but I also remember uh, Clark, uh, Carsey telling me, well, Dad likes to go and see where the ducks were. Well, he would be. go. I, mean, I didn't go with him just a whole lot, but I'd get to go sometimes, and he would pull up. Their main place they had there was a there was a big 
hill you could sit there and watch. And he'd sit there and watch for a while, and then he'd he had a Argo, and he'd right he'd go right to where most ducks were. And honestly, at the time, you could not. There's no way you could do it today. He would take bundles of cane, just bright green, doesn't even blend in with where it was, and just literally just kind of space it around there, and you shoot ducks out of the Argo in the wide open. He, we couldn't any more do that day than man the moon. But back then, we did. It, but he would go as... where they were, and his his thing was was just like wait and see where they're using because he thought, you know, and I, I think he's probably right. Jim probably agreed to that too. There's some reason they pick certain spots, and then that's their spot for the day, and then it might not be, you know, a, a couple of days from now. So that was what he was thinking. And I think part of it was, I never really asked him, but like let them eat a little bit first, just like I've been saying. Yeah. So he didn't go at daylight that mu- that often. You know? That's an interesting thought, the way you had that uh, on the early morning. So, Dudley, there, what? Yeah, there's no doubt. Yeah, I like my sleep, so I, I could get on board with that. Yeah, mm-hmm. sure. <laughs> you got I mean, another another question, Dud? Uh, let's see. Thomas Rexler wanted to know if, if you'd rather hunt the thaw after a few days of hard freeze or the day of an incoming hunt. When is that normally? <clears throat> I want, when is that I want normally pick, better? I want to pick both. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's always good on the front side when they go to hit the feed heavy. After a thaw, you go hunt a food source. If it starts to thaw, hunt a, find a food source, and that's some of the best there is, you know, right when it starts thawing out. I was hunting a break one year, and we'd had a hard freeze, and it was old dead, and we had piles and piles of ducks crossing us, and we was blowing our heads off, and they wouldn't even look at you. They'd go into a rice field right next to us, and we'd slid over there, and shot them up either one can be great it's fun to be on both sides of that mm-hmm. and that's why i say both i'm not going to pick one over the other but mm-hmm. i want to be there for both gotcha mac you got a question i do i do i i've got a few but there's there's two that i really have been curious about so we've talked about you know habitat and and huntability and and, and kind of the duck in, in general, but what species of ducks are growing? Is is you know mallards growing, pintails, wood ducks, or or fallen, or kind of ha- how is that population change right now? Yeah, well, right now uh, we're we're kind of seeing a lot of falling just because of the the water conditions up in the prairies and the nesting grounds. Uh, blue and teal, I think we've we've seen a rapid response, so they're more. Oh, and this is going back to, to college biology, uh, are selected. So basically they're having more young and they're shorter lived. So they're able to kind of recover more quickly than some of these slightly longer lived ducks like mallards or pintails. Uh, so blue wings obviously did well this year. And as really with all of them, it's it's so dependent on habitat on the nesting grounds to where if we just have two or three good years of, of good habitat up there, those populations are going to be moving moving in the right direction really quick. Uh yeah, wood ducks, wood ducks are a tough one. They're declining in some areas. We think some of that's kind of due to broodering habitat, not just nesting habitat. So we know a lot of these areas have good natural cavities, places for them to nest. But then they're they're really uh, not dependent, but, but they do well in emergent marsh habitats, which we're losing, especially in the upper Mississippi River Valley and Illinois River Valley, uh, to where we think that could be influencing some decline in, in wood ducks. But I'm not sure... I, I certainly don't have data to support that, but that's just kind of been the trend I've I've been seeing and, and feeling. Ron, it's uh, it's obvious uh, you you hunt, mm-hmm. and you're a fantastic photographer. We saw oh, some stuff on uh, RyanAspirin <coughs> dot com. It's Amazing. incredible. Thank you. Photography, but if you were somebody said, okay, you're in charge of all these ducks. <laughs> if somebody said that, or is there things that you say, okay, this is what I would do. One, two, three. Th- these are changes that I would make. And would I ju- we're just, I'm just asking your opinion. Yeah. In, so in the wintering grounds, I mean, one of the biggest things is fixing hydrology. We've seen uh, just huge issues from uh, these major river systems flooding from all this uh, levying and draining of these major river systems have just forced the rivers into a smaller area that are leading to all these flood issues. And that's been really detrimental to waterfowl habitat, kind of this latitude uh, up through the Midwest. Uh, so that's a big thing. If, if, if I could fix one thing, I think hydrology would be a big part. And that, of course, is leading to red oak decline in Arkansas and where we're seeing these shifts of historically red oak areas into overcup and 
uh, more water tolerant white oak species that aren't food for ducks uh, that aren't really benefiting ducks. Uh, so yeah, the fixing fixing hydrology would be one of the biggest ones, both at regional and and fine scale. That sounds like a big ask. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. that's if if I had a genie, that that is what one of my wishes. Uh, mm. And then you know that just that's not going to happen. So how can we compensate as gamekeepers, as people who care for? Yeah. <clears throat> enormously for the future of our ducks. How can we adapt that? Because the that goes back to what I love so much is our our mission here. Uh, our evangelism is like air, the way we can make the most effective change is not by like lobbying our governments or you know maybe donating to the big wildlife organizations. That's all important, but every single person. And there, you know, everybody we were listening right has some kind of influence, or they do the work on some place. And we have the power to do that as a group when we can do positive stuff for wildlife. And so, my point in saying this, and I will just uh, till I'm blue in the face, or y'all bury me someday, is like empower every single person to become that gamekeeper and become conservation conscious in their own place and together everybody that hunts can make a huge difference yeah, yeah. more so than any other entity yep even if all you have is your backyard that's right yeah. sure yeah, absolutely yep. and so yeah and just having the knowledge and spreading it and you know getting it out to people and doing you know take care of your own spot and i know waterfowl especially is important because we have to depend on our neighbors Yep. so much yeah yeah and that's it's we have to manage in complexes so we have to have landowners that are willing to really care about the resource and mm -hmm. not just about shooting that resource for a short time mm -hmm. uh to really make a, a difference on the landscape but no that's that's absolutely right i mean I, and i've got great confidence that there's so many people that want to do right but they just don't know what to do mm -hmm. yeah know? yeah and even i want to know more and more all the time all the, yeah I, I'd throw another caveat out there besides to do all you can with the habitat you work on. Um, and, you know, like you said, you mentioned you can donate to the wildlife organization. Absolutely. But go buy you an extra federal duck stamp. Mm -hmm. And that'll go directly yes, to mm -hmm. waterfowl conservation. Great one of idea. the first TV shows hunting the country in the early 90s, and uh, Paul Newsom was our host. And one of the, I think it might have been the very first show. But he was opening the show, and he was talking about he was addressing anti hunters and animal lovers. He said, "If you love animals, you're an animal lover." He said, "And you want to give money to be sure the most, the highest percentage of your money goes directly to an animal to help an animal. The top place you can donate to is go to whatever state you're in and buy a hunting license." Yep. And that shocked a lot of people. Oh, it isn't. It's giving it to PETA. It's giving it to this. It's giving to that. It's giving to a conservation organization. Not short in any of those. Even the animal rights. That's you know that's that's what people love. That's fine. I don't have a problem. But the truth is the truth. And buying a hunting license will do more for wildlife than anything you can do. Yep. Yeah. Well yep. said, Mac. You look like you had another question. I do. I, I have one for both of y'all, uh, and I, I want to get both of your answers, I guess. <clears throat> With a gamekeeper mindset, when would be the best time to put water on a hole? Also, when would be the, less, the best time to drain that, that same hole? That will all depend on what it is. Yeah. You know, yeah. it, it, that depends on, on the kind of habitat. If you're talking, you know, bottomland hardwood, wait as long as you can, make sure the tree's dormant before you put water on it, and then get the water off you know late winter early spring um if it's a uh, if it's a hot food crop depending on the time of year you got, got to think about how long that grain will last underwater or being flooded so you got to weigh in a lot of things there but um with us now at home there's folks starting to get some water on the landscape um there's always an opportunity for some early water you hope for a little rain but i'd say at our latitude right now is a fair time to start getting some water on some fields uh, catching some of the early migrants and then in the woods i'd say you're okay starting to get a little water now we've had three good hard frost in a row so but i'm not i'm not completely 
believing that these trees are all dormant. My trees are still dropping sap pretty good. They're still yeah. green. I think they're still sucking a little water. But uh, I'll let our certified smart person take it. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, it depends. It's very dependent. Uh, so like Jim said, these trees are not dormant. So putting water on now is adding some sort of stress, whether that's got lasting impact impacts is, is I think, a fair question. Uh, but in terms of gamekeeper and thinking about multiple populations, getting early water on is especially important on, on fields and moist soil. For all these early migrants, bluing teal, uh, shorebirds, I'm a big birder, so I love all all taxa of birds. Uh, but providing habitat for those those migrants is really lacking, especially across the south, because it's, it's a dry time of year, and it's amazing how just a little bit of water on a rice field just flashing across can provide just incredible shorebird and, and early migrant blue and teal and pintail habitat. Uh, and it's it's cool to see the response when people are doing that. So, I mean, like, if you've only got one little spot, I'll, I'll add to it, you know, maybe get to know your neighbors better. You might could go on a cycle where one of you keeps the water on longer one year and, and the other neighbor takes it off sooner. And I, just, I'll speak to that. If I had one spot and that was it, I wouldn't be putting water on it right now because mm -hmm. uh, it'll be gone by the time the hunting gets really good yeah. or it will be <clears throat> not nearly as bay. I, from my own experience, they seem to like the freshly flooded food the very, very best. Oh, yeah. You know, yep. before it even gets kind of like, it almost reminds me of pouring something on your, you know, cornflakes and they're a lot better when you eat them in the first few minutes than when they get soggy or something. <laughs> I you like know? that. I and like so – if I could, I, we can't really, we don't have the wherewithal. We have a lot of spots, but we don't have the wherewithal to really, really control it. I'd be, I mean, I would want freshly flooded stuff mm -hmm. around Christmas. I'd even save a few places for after the yeah, first, you, you know, because we go yeah. to the 31st of de January. Mm -hmm. And the other thing for us is a big, you know, weakness. It's almost all in a major floodplain. So if we get one yeah. of those, I, I can think of twice we went somewhere for Christmas a couple of days and had such a flood it covered up everything and we lose a lot of that native seed lose lot and millets. Feet. Yeah. And when there's a lot of flow in the ponds when that yeah. happens and so uh so I'm my only point saying that well I would be if you have multiple spots I'd be saving some. Yeah. Save some. And Absolutely. also too think about how Mother Nature did it before we had levees on the landscape and we're artificially holding water, artificially flooding for duck use or waterfowl use. Think of that, think of a river flow and you get a little rise and that feathered edge of fresh food. So you always try to emulate that through the year. So if you got a big track of woods, you know, start maybe here, try to emulate how Mother Nature flooded it. We'll go a long way. Even with uh, crop ground or, or moist soil, if you can adjust that water level to you, always got something fresh and something new for them to feed on, you'll be way better off. When we get a big water like that it's really hard to hunt them for us yeah you, yeah. Take, you get too much water yeah you, you know we go from having you know a few impoundments here up and down the, the main creeks and stuff to to being you know like a you know a couple hundred thousand acre reservoir you know because that whole bottom will flood from here to tupelo yeah. and up north of houston and yeah. all through there but there'll always be where we can find some where it freshly flooded in the shallowest water that's yeah. where there'll be every yep. time keep in mind that most puddle duck species feed or most Surface feeding birds feeding yeah. six inches of water or less. So yeah. um, that's what they like to use, whether they're, they're eating seeds, grain, or bugs. There's so many different scenarios. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It's what makes you it just, fun. You have to yes. take it on a case by case basis. Yes. So, Dudley, is there any more of these questions bubbled up as something we need to ask? Let's see. Uh, do moon phases affect waterfowl behavior? Great question. Taylor Bobo again. Yeah, that is, that is a great question. That's something we're looking at. So we have a few different students. We're looking at, at moon illumination, not just what moon illumination is at that time, but actually how many hours that moon's up at night. Uh, and there's, there's definitely a relationship there. Seems like there's a lot more evening, uh, post-dusk feeding at those greater moon illumination. So it's not really influencing the morning, uh, at least based on our transmitter data, but after sunset is really where they're able to to keep moving around the landscape longer uh, and feeding and escaping predation risk. Gotta have an influence. Yeah, no doubt, yeah, for sure. So I, I've got a question. You've you brought one of these GPS transmitters that's laying here uh, on the table. It's not very big. It weighs hardly anything. Yeah. So 
if a hunter harvests a bird that's got one of these, you want them to report that. That's not. It, it, please, guys, let somebody know. Don't don't. Uh, that, that's the only way they can can learn something, right? Yep. Yeah. So we with these, we're going to know if you shot one. I mean, I can I can track you to your house if you <laughs> shot one, and and it's still working. And that's happening. Is there a good story? <laughs> and and, and I've happened. done that. I'm, I'd love to hear that. Like somebody shot a duck out Uh-oh, of season. It's gonna and, blow. And yeah. realized it had a transmitter on it, and you know. Yeah, I I've I have two stories. So one was a Canada Goose transmitter that I worked up around Chicago, uh, looking at a bunch of different questions with the University of Illinois. But we had a transmitter that molt migrated up to Hudson Bay, coming back, got shot in Wisconsin. I'm guessing got shot off the road because all the locations were right around a county road, and then it was in somebody's <laughs> house. Didn't hear anything. Band wasn't reported. We had our phone number on the transmitter. Didn't get a call. I was able to get on, I guess I shouldn't say the server or the, the the app because I don't know who you guys have partnerships with. But I got on an app, figured out who the landowner was. I was able to track down, figure out that the lady had a son who was in, like, high school. And I was actually able to get his cell phone number. And I just cold called him. And he was he was spooked. I mean, he, <laughs> he, he definitely was a little weirded out. And, and justifiably so. Yeah. But it had been, like, three weeks since he since he shot it uh and i got the transmitter back I, so so that was a good recovery and then yeah we've had a white fronted goose uh that usgs put a transmitter on that they gave me the data to up in alaska and i got a a call from a, a buddy uh who had a buddy who allegedly shot it off the highway with a rifle seeing the redneck collar that the transmitter was attached oh to gosh. Acted like he was changing his tire, ran out, grabbed it, realized it had a transmitter, so he just bashed it with a hammer and, and I guess still took it home, but mm. we never got that transmitter back and stuff like that. Oh Gets God. a little frustrating. So sad. Nice turn, Don't man. be a you-know-what. Yeah, just yeah. Turn man. Yep. Which one of these transmitters cost? Uh, they're about 1100 bucks. Wow. Uh, we yeah. Could, we could probably put one of those on Clay Davis's truck so we'd know where he's going could we do that to actually no. like no, you never keep up with blow it. up <laughs> yeah he'd rewire it so you get people donate money uh, to the, y'all's organization uh, the arkansas university of arkansas monticello y'all are able to buy these and through by having these you're able to to study the migration habits and know what's going on so how could we how could we help get more of these in y'all's hands yeah yeah so uh the five oaks ag research and education center is a 503c uh not for profit so we're able to uh, essentially get donations uh for these different projects and we've got a lot of great funding partners and have worked with like fish and wildlife service and uh a lot of kind of the the traditional funding routes as well as getting some some private and and industry uh, sponsorship on on some of these sounds like we need programs. to get some competition between the companies that make these. Yeah, no doubt about it. Yeah. I mean, it seems like that. What a great gift to conservation if they would actually. I know they're in business to, you know, feed their families and make a living. But man, yeah, yeah, these that, ones are actually they're made in Lithuania. Which when you tell the university that you want to send a check to Lithuania, they get. Mm-hmm. <laughs> A little freaked out, but they're they're incredible. We've we've had great luck with them. Transmitter technology is continuing to evolve and oh, and get better. And it yeah, literally small hardly small. weighs anything. Yeah. So yeah. you can strap yeah. that. You, there's a uh, some kind of way you bind that to the bird's back. Yep, yep. So we're just using basically elastic ribbon uh, to go around the front of the wings and then one behind the wings. And I think transmitter attachment definitely could get better, but that's the best we best we have right now. And we. We have a few birds. We just had one that was deployed in 2019 get shot in, I think, North Dakota. Uh, so some of them are lasting quite a while. And in theory, so they have a solar panel on them with internal batteries. So in theory, that transmitter is going to work as long as that bird's alive. Uh, wow. So they can last a while. With Canada Geese, I have, I have a transmitter on Canada Goose right now that's going on eight years. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. That's incredible. They're but the, the science that is going on, I, I mean, there's a number of schools, Ryan. We, 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 Mississippi State's right here. We, yep. We've yep. talked to – Brian Davis Tennessee. is awesome. That's right, yeah. yeah. And, and we talked to a lot of different university uh, professors, and the research that's going on is just fascinating. Yeah. It, it, it really is. And it's just – I would think that with technology improving like it is, it's just going to 
get that much better. Yes, sir. Yeah, and that's I'm I'm just trying to keep up with everybody else. There's lots of so people that are a lot these? smarter than me. Uh, Jimbo, you you know you've forgotten more than I'll ever know about any of this. But can you see these when you're looking and ducks are pitching in? Can you tell they've got a transmitter on them? I can't. I mean, once you if you're there when we put them on and you turn them loose, you see them for a little bit. But once they get used to them, it's hard to see them till you. Get so them I'm just in saying, I, if 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 if, you're if you could tell that they're there, would you rather people not shoot the duck? Yeah, ideally they're yeah. they're giving us much better data when they're alive right. than when yep. they're dead. But it's it's so hard to you're probably gonna see the leg band before you see the transmitter. We've even gotten pictures the birds will actually preen in this entire transmitter. So the only thing you can even see yeah. in hand is the little solar panel wow. sticking up. Wow. The pretty, biggest thing yeah. is please, please, please turn them in. Yep, please, yes. please turn in transmitters. We'll send you a replica. Please always report your bands. Yes. Uh, that's incredibly important data that we're working with a lot mm-hmm. too. Now, if you see one coming in with a piece of rice straw hanging off its leg, it's probably banded, and it may have one of them on it. Yeah, I, there was, I guess it's been Watch out now. five or six years, and there was this, uh, someone thought it was wounded, and then, but it kept coming by. It turned out we could tell, and that's not the easiest thing to determine. It was a hen, red, uh, hen canvas back. And someone's like, it was wounded, the legs just sticking out behind it, whatever, and then, there's several different hunts. We saw this duck, but it was, it was a canvas back. We couldn't shoot them. Thank goodness we realized what it was. But it, it turned out it was an antenna sticking out. Oh, wow. Ah. So it had to be something along these yeah. lines. Yeah. they've So with diving ducks, these don't work as well just because they have to dive, and right. it's creating more resistance. So a lot of time with diving ducks, they'll actually implant the transmitter. Yeah, so it was, like a, it was like a little antenna thing sticking yeah, out. sticking out of its back. See it, yeah. She may have been spying on you, Tox. Yeah. <laughs> I still remember, but it looked like it, when they fly by, it was like a, a wounded duck that can't hold its legs up under, and it's just kind of sticking out behind them. But it, you know. Yeah, there's some funny stories, especially around like Iran and and Egypt, where researchers are putting transmitters on things, and then the foreign governments capturing them and claiming it's the other government spying on them. With the, <laughs> and there, I, there could be some truth to yeah. it, but I know a lot of good researchers have, have so run into some of those. Questions. When you put that on a on a duck and you pitch it in the air does it react does it with that does it act like oh my gosh there's I something got on my back yeah yeah it it depends sometimes they fly great uh sometimes they really have to get it preened in before they're feeling comfortable enough to really move around so the reason i ask is when we first started the hunt in the country television show i went to north dakota and filmed a with the u.s fish and wildlife service banding some 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 ducks and it was a it was a late summer and, and they had fed them and these ducks would make this huge push up to this bait and the ducks in the front didn't want to go up there because they knew something was fixing to happen but the ducks in the back were pushing and they just, it was just the most fascinating thing but at the end of the day when you would hold up a duck and put a band on their leg they would drop that leg like you had put an anvil yeah. and you know that a band weighs nothing yeah but they they you would throw them in the air and they'd fly off and that leg would be hanging down yeah 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 it it freaks them out for sure at the start, and there's all sorts of other, you know, getting a rocket net shot over you wouldn't be a real pleasant experience in the first place. <laughs> I uh, mean, my wedding band took a while to get used to. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. true. But yeah, they, they definitely notice it, but they, they adapt pretty quick. So what questions are we not asking? What What's something interesting that you need to tell us that that we're not asking about in terms of migration or red oaks or? Any new studies or? Yeah, game farm mallards. Uh, it's a big topic right now, so releasing these kind of European strain mallards uh, into the population, mostly for recreation. Clubs have been doing it out in the Atlantic flyway for a long time. There's still clubs even across the country doing it. Uh, but they're really driving a lot of hybridization. So this is all, again, people a lot smarter than me, Phil Oretsky at uh, Texas a um, El Paso, uh, really getting into this and drilling down into it. But... There's a pretty high proportion of, of Atlantic flyway mallards and Great Lakes mallards that are not native North American mallards. They're these introduced game farm mallards that were bred to be smaller, uh, different morph metrics. So they're, even their bill morphology is different. So they're more equipped to eat like big seeds, like corn and, and pellet feed, basically. And we know that's having some influence on, on our kind of native North American mallards. So you think it's making them more vulnerable and not as successful Yes. To nest and so forth. Yeah. So 
just want to get make it clear what you're saying is that practice is not good for it is not no no Uh, and it's probably influencing even migration distributional things to where where these ducks might be there's there's nothing about that that sounds like it could be yeah 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 Yeah. and there's i it's pretty emergent i mean that's it's fairly recent uh and we're kind of getting involved in some of that and starting to use transmitters paired with those genetic data to to really think about if those ducks are moving around the landscape differently and and how kind of how much affinity they have to urban areas versus more natural wrp and moist soil type areas yeah well i was just yeah, a, hope and pray if something is definitively proven with quantitative scrubbed perfect research to be detrimental to wild game and wildlife that it's addressed and banned and doesn't allow to keep getting going going yeah. on just because of whatever monetary or yeah. financial reasons. So one of oh my God, pray. Yeah. One of the biggest the negatives one of the biggest done. negatives that I think Lavretsky's work has clearly shown is that these same game farm allergies are really what's driving hybridization with black ducks. Oh, uh, that's, yeah. Which is data is also showing that there's still a pretty distinct black duck lineage that's kind of staying separate from that. But apparently these game farm allergies will mate with anything. Uh, so that's really where we think <laughs> we think they're driving a lot of that hybridization with, with wow. black ducks and model ducks, uh, these wow. introduced mallards. Well, you know, look, well, we, I started off mentioning the black duck. This one, it, it, probably my favorite duck. Yeah, And, and so I can cool. think of a, a handful. I don't think I've killed but a couple. But yeah. just the thought, sometimes I mean, I've been in the blind we kill, them every, we kill them every hunt back in the that's crazy. Say, I, late seventies into the eighties, right there. Well, I didn't realize I, I, that. I've been hunting on Toxic Plus when a group of milers swung by in the sunshine, and somebody said, "There's a black duck," and it's like nobody says anything. <laughs> we might not even shoot into that group just because we know how rare it is. Yep. And to think we that something we, yeah. might be damaging the yeah. lineage of the. Oh, but I mean, we don't. And this is that was a different place because that was actually at the Cottrell Lake. That's the only place we had at the time, and I guess they. They'd used that over the years and we're coming back every year, but I skipped to where we've got north of there 10 miles and got so much stuff now. Uh, we don't even see one a year mm. killed. No. Wow. You know, you can always tell around us if you've had a big storm system in the northeast, we stop, you, you, and if you're hunting in, especially in northeast Arkansas, you pick up a few black ducks. Or if you have a big river in the white, white and the cash is up and there's a big push out of the northeast, they'll come down to Ohio and you pick some up. But it's a, the Chris and them guys when I was hunting with them in Ohio mm-hmm. killed a black duck. I was excited, and one of the guys we was hunting with was a rider by the name of Rick Nemechek, and he was hunting with me years ago, and we killed a black duck home. He said, "Man, Jimbo, I remember you getting awfully excited about that." And I said, "Well, yeah, they're pretty much kind of a trophy at home. You know, mm-hmm. you shoot a black duck, you, yes, sir. it's a cool deal, and you know they shoot them pretty regular up there. So, wow, mm-hmm. pretty neat." Yeah, yeah, and, and I we've think seen some. Hi- we have seen hybrids. Have you? Oh and yeah, the, we, we uh, quite a few had the glazed green head. Yep, you know? mm-hmm. yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, good luck. Keep us posted on that because that. Yeah, more yeah, like I said, that, yeah, Phil Lavretsky would be another. He gives great talks. Really, really neat guy. So maybe we'd yeah. get him to write an article. Yeah, we could. Uh, look, we're, we we love ducks. Anything that uh, that that could be detrimental, we will. You know. Figure Even if out. it's not in my best interest, one thing we should all strive for in love of the wild is don't be scared of the truth. Yeah. And let's just let the let the truth have sunlight yeah. and let the chips fall where they may. I mean, you know, it may be something detrimental to us, but you know what? We'll have to shift gears and do something different, I guess. But yeah. what we don't need to do is hide the truth. Yeah. Well, and that's – I'm in a really neat position, and, and Dr. Osborne and I are in a really neat position with our partnership with Mr. George at Five Oaks is, is we can pursue some of these, these questions that, I mean, typically university studies wouldn't address and really really use management and, I mean, the resource holders, the stakeholders in all this to, mm-hmm. to help guide, guide our research, and that's been a really neat, neat opportunity through this program. So, look, uh, we're at this stage of the conversation. I think I'd like to turn it over to Dudley and let him do some rapid-fire questions ah. to you. Oh, oh yeah, and, it's uh, rapid-fire time. So, Ryan, these are going to be pointed at you Ooh. now. What, we've got a little segment Uh-oh. we call Rapid Fire, and it's brought to you by our friends at Springfield Armory. Lanny, you had your pistol on your hip the other day. I'm going to tell you what, that's a, that's a serious 
piece of equipment is the best I can put it. That's for sure. They're nice pistols. They're they nice they pistols. sure are. All right, so Ryan, so Dudley's got some questions. You just uh, we're yeah. gonna turn. So oh, this, this is terrifying. Uh, a or B, you, yes or no? Yeah, boom, can, boom, boom, boom. Okay. Give you two. You can pick one or say neither. So there's not yep. a wrong answer. Okay. Just oh. let everybody get to know you a little bit better. All right. <laughs> All right, fire that Cue music, the music back up. Are you ready? Yes, sir. All right, duck meat or deer meat? Duck. Fried or grilled? Grilled. Hearts or gizzards? Ooh, gizzards. Good man. Uh, <laughs> semi-auto or over and under? Semi-auto. Divers or dabblers? Dabblers. Boat or blind or natural hunting? Natural. Public or private? Oh, <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> private. Uh, <laughs> camera or shotgun? Both. Yeah. Sony or Canon? Oh, neither. Oh, whoa. <laughs> Are you a Nikon I man? am. I am a Nikon I, man. Oh, I wow. love you even more. <laughs> uh, blind food, sweet or salty? It's sweet. All right. Always. Single read or double read? Single. Mm. Finally, which is cooler, hybrid duck or jack minor banded duck? Hybrid. Ah. I, I got to take hybrid. Mm. <laughs> what? <laughs> I, I'm a hybrid guy myself. Yeah. So. I, I know where that Jack Minor band came from right away. Yeah, that's right. It's, that story is one of the coolest parts for me. So. Yeah. That, that was good. Good. Good job. Oh, thanks. Yeah. thanks. Yeah. Well, he didn't. I'm glad I didn't disappoint. No, no. But, but and stopped all, him in his tracks, public or private, because yeah. it was like, <laughs> I'm going to have to be honest, but I don't want to say it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Rob and I were talking about these questions earlier, and, and we were talking about the cameras. So, I got to rib Rob. Yeah, I, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm he, sorry. Uh, I was, I was like, is it Nikon or Canon? And he was like, a lot of people are shooting Sony now, so it's probably more of a Sony or Canon. Yeah, mm. yeah. No, so, I, I've, I've talked about switching Sony. I was a Nikon guy stuck. back in my day yeah, as well. Yeah, so. we started out on Nikons. Too. Fiercely loyal. Love it. Well, awesome. let, let, let's let's do this now. So uh, now we'll ask a Uh-oh. trivia question of both of you guys. Oh. If y'all get it right, one of our listeners will win a prize, and so we turn it over to Mac here. So Mac, right. and if we... they get it wrong, we're still gonna give them a prize. <laughs> yes. Oh, good. Oh, yeah. even, even better. Right. It takes the yeah. pressure right. off. Right. I like that. Yeah. So we've got uh, we've got a lot. We've got this Nosler number nine edition. And we've got a Princeton headlight that we can give away this week. So nice. And a case of I have, chips. I've yeah, read yeah, my, no, my oh, Nosler. Wow. A whole case. A whole case of chips. Man. Wow. Uh, Woo. Dudley has cracked into every case of chips. Yeah, right there. minus so the ones that Dudley <laughs> ate out of there. <laughs> I, uh, I've got a Nosler 8 right by the bed, and I've got it memorized. And uh, I don't reload a lot, but it's really interesting. It, 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 it actually is. And we'll get Dudley to sign this edition. Oh, my gosh. That, 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 that would wow. lower, Triple that the value. Would lower the value. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, I think this question, if I'll go ahead and say this. I, I think you guys will knock this one out of the park. But I think some of our listeners will learn something if they'll pay attention. So. Oh, what this is all on you, Bob. What if they don't, Bobby? I don't, You've embarrassed well, them. We're going to try. Now you, can, you can phone a friend. E- either one of you can phone a friend next to you. All right, so we're playing for J.M. Hearn. And uh, if they get this right, J.M., reach out to us on gamekeepers at mossyoak.com. That's G-A-M-E-K-E-E-P-E-R-S at mossyoak.com. Wow. wow. Good, that, good job, yeah. Matt. <laughs> Passed the spelling test for today, right. didn't he? Mm-hmm. I just want to make sure hey, make sure he gets his prize. There you go. All right. <laughs> All right, so the question is, what is the term used to describe the ducks when ducks and geese turn vertical in flight to drop rapidly in altitude? Whiffling. That, that's wow. it. Yeah, that, that would be correct. So. Wait, say that again. Whiffling. Whiffling? Whiffling. Okay. Because, you know, we had a whole series, <laughs> Whiffling Wings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty good. The Mike Tyson <laughs> series. <laughs> yeah. That's good, Tyson. That's, that's really good. Now, I did hear the term the other day on the spec hunt. One fella called it Chica Pennant. Huh, Chica Pennant. I have no idea where it come from. I've heard it called Waffling, too. Yeah. Waffling, mm-hmm. Whiffling, same. Yeah. yeah. I heard that question yesterday, and I did not know the answer. So now, yeah. now I know. Now you yeah. know. Lanny, you, were you going to say waffling? Well, I thought I was. I thought I was going to answer. Yeah, answer. So, <laughs> you know, I should, yeah, but I was going to say waffling. Yeah, well, that's pretty close. So, well, Dudley, have you got to ask a Dudley question? I do. Um, guy named Craig sent this in, um, 
and it's uh, similar to what some of the stuff we've been talking about. Uh, Dudley, can you give me some tips for getting y'all seedlings established in an area that typically floods? We're in a hunting camp inside the levee uh, on the Mississippi River, kind of near Greenville, Mississippi. Um, Great question. And, Great question. Uh, yes. I'm, I'm listening. And that can yeah. probably go into the, you know, the duck hole thing. We oh, probably 100%. need to cover that as well while yeah. we're here. But uh, I've sold a lot of. Uh, trees and tubes to folks that are inside the levee and you know a lot of times the, the river gets up gets up and and floods uh, but what i have learned just from uh, reading and learning uh, and and do it myself and feedback from customers is that uh, one of the best ways to do that is to mitigate your risk by splitting your planting season so if you can do a little bit of fall planting and a little bit of spring planting because oftentimes you don't know when you're going to get that flood. Um, and then uh, another thing is just try to pick, uh, when you're planting trees, try to pick, just there may even be a three-inch difference in elevation. Mm -hmm. um, Makes a huge difference. And so uh, instead of just planting on a 25 by 25 grid or whatever, uh, go out of your way to try to pick little bitty micro sites where where there may be a higher elevation. So a bigger issue is not whether it got flooded for a month or two, but that it's it's standing water for months at a time. That's the issue. Yeah, um, and if it if it gets over the head of the seedling, right. that can be more detrimental because it it can't breathe. The right. tip is right. is covered in water. Right. Uh, the colder the water, the better. Uh, if there's movement in the water, that's better. So, you know, stagnant or warmer water is worse. Hmm. Um, but it, it's it's really all over the place. I've had customers, uh, you remember the year that uh, the South Delta flooded mm -hmm. so much. Mm -hmm. I had people tell me that they had trees underwater completely submerged for seven months and still had 80% survival. Wow. And then I've had customers that, you know, did have the moving water in the winter that lost a lot more. And that could have been maybe the soil eroding around the roots, you know, almost like mm -hmm. creating a little eddy or, or a swirl where yeah, the, right. where the root. Um, so if you had to choose, though, one or the other, would you say if you can get your water off immediately after duck season, that would be the best time? Yes. And and I guess since we're on this subject, if this is a – a duck impoundment that you can control the water on. Right. Um, first, I would say if you have one duck hole, I probably, as much as I want you guys to buy my trees, I would probably say don't just have your one duck hole covered in oak trees. Oh, no, not completely. Yeah. Um, or plant them along the bank, right. maybe. Right. Yeah, plant them along the bank. Because they're still going to do a, a lot for you. We have a bank, lot of probably. folks doing yeah. that. Plant them along the bank where the acorns can mm -hmm. fall in. The the leaves are just as beneficial for mm -hmm. insects. They'll, they'll, they'll sure crawl up on a dry bank to eat, a, to eat oh, yeah. acorns. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This may sound like a Captain Obvious answer, but make sure you're planting species-specific trees to a bottomland area. Obviously. You know. So um, here in the south, we typically do a mix of willow oak and nut all oak. Uh, if you want to get crazy with it, um, I would say the order of flood tolerance, and you may disagree, would be uh, nut all, then willow, and the further north you've got pin oak, yep. which is probably tied with willow oak, and then you start getting into uh, water oak and cherry bark, mm -hmm. yep. um, and those would be water oak and cherry bark would be the ones you would want to flood the latest and get the water off the soonest. Um, and if you are going to plant trees in a duck hole and flood it every year and keep the water on for a really long time, don't. You'll, you'll yep. be let down. You, right. you may want to do some moist soil stuff instead. Yep. So. Yep. Well, that was good. That was good one, Don. Mr. Know-it-all. Yeah. And, and if you've got any questions that are specific to your particular scenario, don't hesitate to email me, uh, nursery at mossyoak.com. And I'll try and get you a, a specific answer. He'll get you fixed up. Good stuff like right there. Another. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. We, we, we should have enjoyed having y'all. Yeah. yeah. Oh, this is Thank y'all awesome. for having here. here. Yeah. Enjoy. We've, we've learned a lot. It, it, we have as much fun as you do. Is that? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that's good because I had a lot of fun. That's good. <laughs> I, one, one more quick question mm -hmm. along those lines. So, how, how big of an acorn 
is too big for ducks. Oh. Mm. Oh. You almost, we almost got by without that question. Yeah, That's yeah. a good one. That, so, are, are nut owls too big for them? No. Okay. No. Nut owls are not too big. Uh, it's when you get into, like, Delta Post Oak right, and yeah. uh, even Schumard. Ooh, Delta yeah. Post and Schumard. Those yeah. Are, Schumard's those are getting pretty yeah. big. And yeah, I, I've definitely heard that they can. They can. I mm. I don't the have data to back that up. The only one I've seen as a kid I saw – on many occasions, I saw wood ducks stuffed all the way down from the back of their beak all the way down with swamp chestnuts. Oh, wow. wow. What? And, yes. Dang. And, and I, a, I've never seen another duck eat them before, but I think a wood duck will eat any acorn. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Oh, wow. yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that's hopefully with this DNA data, this this diet study. We'll that have back in a year. I can't wait to hear about that. Yeah. yeah. Ron, or, do you ever watch our television show on the Outdoor Channel? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. So, yeah. Richie, Talk wait, about putting wake him up, on the Richie. spot. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you expect him to say, no, do y'all have a TV show? I didn't know that. Game what? Richie, let's hook up with him. I bet you he's got some subject matters for television that would be off the, off the charts. I imagine so. Yeah. So, would you, would you make wow. a, a pro- – Promise me, Richie. Richie you'll, woke you'll, up. Good yeah. Time. Promise me, Richie, that you'll look into that. I'll, I'll, I'll do what I can. Okay. Words from the mountain. Top, yeah, right there. There you go. Pinky on public promise. record. Yeah. So, Ron, thank you for being here, y'all. Yeah. Tra- Jim, no, y'all traveled all, all the way down, and I know guys. y'all got to get back because you're trying to put boards in some risers th- this evening. Before that the rain, range. that rain talks he's talking about is coming. It's going to hit us before it hits going y'all. Going to hit him first. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. yeah. Yep. I just hope. Hey, I don't want to talk about it. Never mind. Yeah. I don't say rain. I don't want jinx. I have enough stuff stopped up that I'm probably. Comfortable. I'm just going to say this. My family is setting up a tailgate Saturday, so it is going to rain. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That's you don't have to worry yeah. about that. Yeah. That'll do it. You may be yeah. right. You that, may be right. You know, in the South, are. cutting hail will do it every time. Yeah. Yep. So. So, look, guys, we'd, uh, we would appreciate if you'd watch the TV show Tuesday nights, the Gamekeepers of Mossy Oak. Y'all check us out. Uh, if you enjoy the podcast, please share it with your friends. Subscribe to it. Give yeah. us a review. You might even win a prize. So, we've had a lot of fun. I'm looking at Toxie. Have you got anything else you want to cover or points you want to cover? I know your stomach's I'm, rumbling. I'm you. thinking, I'm thinking do we, can we make it <laughs> under the wire for fried chicken? It's going to be close. I show sure love some fried chicken. Yeah, well, don't stand in front of Lanny, mm-hmm. but between Lanny and the door when no. this is over with. So, say goodbye, Dudley. What? Oh, no, I'm sorry. What? Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, one one last got? shameless plug. Oh, uh, oh yeah, with, with this Five Oaks program, we we, we're, we're trying to train the next generation of, of science-based game keepers. So we've got four graduate certificate students right now that we're training up. We're giving them science background through UAM. Uh, they're getting the habitat, the hands-on equipment operation experience at Five Oaks. Uh, and we're just... If there's anybody looking for for new managers uh, that they're looking to hire in the next few years, we should be pumping four Got great young crop. people out. All right, out every, awesome. every That's single good. year. So four good, good. So hit us child. up. Yeah, and and have y'all got a like a, a, a Instagram handle? We've got an Instagram. Yep. yep. So it's Foagrec, which is Five Oaks Ag Research and Education Center. Uh, we've got a website. You can just Google Five Oaks, and you should be able to find the the research and we'll, center. We'll post that for people too. Yeah. So that would be fantastic. Sure will. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Okay. All right, Jim, you got anything? No. Man, uh, yeah, just plug, uh, check out drakewaterfowl.com. There you there go. There you go. All right, that's, that sounds good. All right, Boys. say goodbye, Dudley. Goodbye, Dudley. Get us out of here, Mac Mac. Quack, quack, quack. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Gamekeeper Podcast. And be sure to tune in again. Subscribe to Gamekeeper Farming for Wildlife magazine and don't miss the Mossy Oak Properties Fistful of Dirt podcast with my good buddy, Ronnie Cuz Strickland.